So before I begin, uh, let me start by saying uh, Carleton University acknowledges the location of its campus on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. Now, uh, an introduction, uh, excuse me, an introduction of our speakers and sponsors. Um, we are pleased to be uh, joined by our uh, guest today, uh, Susan Burho, who is the coordinator of programs. Uh, also, where's a few hats? A student advisor is waving there. Hi, Susan. Uh, student advisor and contract instructor with the Enriched Support Program. Um, we're also be uh, also pleased to be joined by our sponsor for the day uh, for the forum in the Sprott School of Business, represented by Associate Dean in Undergraduate Studies, Howard Nemeroff. Welcome, Howard. Nice wave. Great background, too. And uh, Howard is also an Associate Press, uh, Professor of Finance in the, in the Sprott School of Business, and Rhonda Kelly, the Undergraduate Program Development and Outreach Coordinator. Um, we're also pleased to be joined by the one and only Jen Sugar, our Director of Admissions. And um, when we uh, uh, we were putting together this program, uh, we went out to the when we asked them, "Hey, Jen," and we asked uh, we asked you, "What are the topics you want to hear about?" You know, and overwhelmingly, um, the topic of the day of the topic du jour was, you know, quad master uh, admissions and and all the intricacies that are going along with uh, doing business and admissions business in in this uh, in the virtual era. So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to have Jen to to talk about that and answer some questions. Um, we had the Ontario University Guidance Dialogues this week. Nearly a thousand counselors, I think, we we were sort of interacting with uh, over over the course of the two day event, and we heard a lot about that topic. So I, I suspect we'll get into that a little bit, which is great. Um, for the agenda today, um, what we're going to do is um, we're going to kick it off with our sponsor, who's going to say a few words about the uh, the, the Sprott School of Business and uh, priorities and the events and exciting things that are happening there, Howard. Uh, and then we'll do some uh, do a quick uh, Q and A, and we'll get into how we'll do that in a second. And then we'll we'll pop over to uh, to Susan, and she'll have uh, her opportunity to tell us some of the things about the ESP. When we invited our guests for these sessions, the um, uh, the idea was that you guys are experts in what we do, and uh, we're we're grateful for that. But there may be things from a sort of a, a toolkit perspective that students are asking you, like, I know about ESP, but like, where's the form, and what's the deadline, and like, what what do I tell the students? Because I'm I'm also dealing with 20 other universities and 20 other colleges. So just you know, give us the you know, cut to the chase here. So uh, our sponsor and our guests will be you know around 10 minutes or so just to to cross the T's and dot the I's on those conversations. And then we'll wrap up, as I mentioned at the outset, with, with Jen Sugar and talk about select topics uh, in the admission uh, world. Okay, so uh, last brief note before we jump in is uh, just a couple of meeting protocol type of things. Um, please feel free to leave your camera off, a number have, of you have, and you did in the University gui Guidance Dialogues. It's Friday, and uh, we, we don't need to see your Friday morning hair. It's all good, uh, and um, uh, so feel free to do that. We're also please encouraging you, if you can, to leave your uh, your microphone muted. I, I know a number of you are actually at the schools, in the offices, and uh, bells are ringing, and students are, are are coming, and all kinds of great things like that. But uh, uh, we're going to ask you to stay muted to, to handle those kind of things, if you can, please. And uh, for questions, uh, if you're comfortable using the audio function once we once the speakers are done, uh, by all means, use the hands up function. And uh, Carly and I will try to track that, and we'll make sure that we get all of your questions answered. I know from the Ontario University Guidance Dialogues experience this week, the preference was for people to just shoot questions into the chat. So we're going to we're going to chat. We're going to uh, track those questions and, and we'll circle back to them before we're done. And uh, for the speakers and, and our sponsor today, um, once you're you're finished and we're done with questions and whatnot, you can feel free, obviously, to stick around for the entire event if you wish. But we understand if you have competing priorities today, then you can you know you can take off to we're, we're, we're cool with that. OK, so um, yeah, so I think that's all I have to say. And I'll take this uh, opportunity to once again, thank you. Thank our guests and everyone for joining us. And I'll introduce our sponsor for the day, Howard from the Sprout School of Business. Howard, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Trevor. And as you can see, I have my Friday hair going. So, uh, <laughs> so nice. there you go. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, um, guidance counselors. And thank you so much for spending a Friday morning with us and allowing me to uh, to speak with you today and share some information about our business degrees. Um, just what we need on a Friday morning, another Zoom or Teams meeting. I'm sure we're all Zoomed out or Teams out. So I do appreciate uh, you taking the time to um, to uh, to hear me out. 
Uh, as Trevor had mentioned, I'm the Associate Dean of Undergraduate Studies here at Sprott. Uh, so that that uh, that means that in my purview is the um, is the um, uh, administration of both the Bachelor of Commerce Honors Degree and the Bachelor of International Business Honors Degree. Uh, those are our two undergraduate degrees. We also have a post baccalaureate diploma, but that's for accounting students for later on, and we could obviously deal with that um, once students do end up arriving here. So I'll talk very briefly about um, who we are, what we do, um, and uh, and some of the new, I guess, new and innovative um, directions that we're going in as a business school. As business schools, obviously, we have to be innovative. We have to be at the forefront. Uh, we have to be nimble, and we're doing our best, certainly during these COVID times, to be as as nimble as possible and recognizing that the world is changing around us, and we need to equip our students to to address those changes and to understand how to help businesses or how to help themselves in terms of a business uh, grow and reach that next level in terms of sustainability and viability. Um, so with that, uh, first, let me just say that I obviously wish that we were all on the Carleton campus right now because we are we would be looking at our new building, which is becoming very close to completion. Uh, we're looking at moving in uh, hopefully within the next few months or at least starting that move within the next few months. Um, with an anticipation of having classes eventually run in that new building. So that will be very exciting. Uh, it looks gorgeous for those of you who have happened to drive by. You can actually still drive through the campus uh, and take a look at that building. And it's absolutely beautiful. Um, there's a huge atrium in the middle uh, where students come in and they engage. It's all about that, that engagement piece, that networking piece, that interaction. Uh, that group dynamic that is critical to the success of a business student as they prepare themselves for the role that they will be playing within a business, which is going to be how to network, how to build relationships, how to understand um, from an empathetic perspective what your client needs, what the what the other party needs, so that you can move forward. So with that, obviously, the new building is probably our um, our number one exciting piece of news. Uh, but I do want to mention a couple of other things. Uh, with regard to some initiatives, uh, we do have what's referred to as a Sprott Student Consultancy Group that is, uh, I guess, in its second or third year now of development. And what this does is it places students in small, intimate groups under the tutorship of a, of a faculty member to actually go out to local industries and solve um, real live problems with those local companies who are faced with, well, certainly most recently with COVID survival, um, but uh, but could be any strategic problems that they might be facing. And we have a, um, a team of, um, of students, a team of, uh, of uh, staff and faculty members who actually support this, uh, this entire enterprise. And what it does is it allows students to actually take their first two or three years worth of theoretical development that they're learning in the classroom and then rolling up their sleeves and actually going out into industry and solving real life what we refer to as real life cases so these are real problems faced by real businesses that our students are um, at the forefront of, uh, of of supporting those companies with uh, so that's that's a huge uh, a huge piece. We're trying to get as many students through this as possible. Obviously, we need to have a lot more. Um, we need to have many projects on the go so that we have enough for those students to participate in. But right now, we have not had any issue uh, um, attracting partners uh, in industry in terms of looking for support from our students. Certainly, once they reach third and fourth year, they're um, they're quite strong. We even team them up with MBA students as well. So there's a there's a lot of excitement in those uh, in those small little intimate groups that actually work directly with businesses in terms of solving those problems. Um, we um, we also with regard to the uh, to the BIB, the Bachelor of International Business program, and that's our our flagship program where students spend a third year abroad studying in a language um, uh, that um, that is new to them. Uh, typically, uh, you know, we have uh, we have a few languages that students study Mandarin, Japanese, so on and so forth, um, where students can actually go to those countries, study in those countries. But what we've done last year is we've actually uh, allowed for the opportunity for students to participate in an internship when they're abroad as well. That has never been the case before. It's always been solely studying um, uh, for two semesters at a campus, a partner campus that we are affiliated with. Uh, but now we have the opportunity for students to actually um, uh, pursue an internship while they're abroad, either for the two semesters 
or for a singular semester, or alternatively, just uh, just study for those two semesters as they would have in the past. So that's a new and exciting initiative. Many of our students in the Bachelor of International Program have actually said the one thing that they find that's missing, I mean, they get this whole worldly, obviously COVID permitting, they get this worldly view where they get to travel, uh, and they get to uh, they get to go abroad and experience what it means to travel abroad in third year. Uh, but the ability to work now while they're abroad just pads their resume even further. Not only do they have a year of experience living abroad and 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 gaining all that cultural awareness and becoming fluent in not only a new language but in the business of that country as well. So fluid in the specifics of running a business or at least understanding how business works internationally, they now have the opportunity to work there as well. So that creates what we think is an incredibly well-rounded student. Um, on the um, on the BCom side, uh, through their four years here, students from day one will be participating in what we refer to as an employability passport. So every year there will be tasks that they must complete in order to um, uh, enhance their employability, whether it be uh, reviewing their resumes, whether it be working on interview skills, whether it be uh, business communication memos, whatever it might be in terms of interacting with their prospective employers, they're trained from day one. So this does not happen only in fourth year, it happens in first year and that becomes critical to our student success when they actually go out on the interview circuit once they hit fourth year because they're already well equipped to deal with those questions that that the interviewers and that the employers are throwing at them so that's also um, a new step a new direction uh, for us the um i guess the the last thing and i'll just very quickly um finish off here with regard to uh, some of our admission tracks and the and the move that we're making here uh, as many of you know, typical admissions to business schools um, require advanced functions, calculus, and 4U English. And then depending on the school, the cutoff grade, in the case of, in the case of Sprott, that cutoff grade is 80%, um, and schools are you know, plus minus in that zone. Uh, what we've done is uh, we've actually expanded into two new uh, innovative and exciting um, approaches for our students, or at least for access granting accessibility to more students. Uh, uh, admissions track number two, so rather than the um, than the standard advanced functions and calculus track, admissions track number two says, well, if you don't have calculus, that's okay. We have a high school calculus course that we've created that we are offering in the first semester of that student's um, attendance here at Sprott that they would take along with four other courses. So rather than the full load of five, they will take four plus the high school calculus equivalent with us and if they pass the high school equivalent, it will be a conditional acceptance. If they pass the high school equivalent that semester, then they just continue on and they're automatically, um, I guess, funneled directly into Sprott come January and continuing on their path. In, in that first semester, those four courses are courses that are only open to Sprott students. So they will gain access to those courses through that first semester. And then, as I said, provided they pass that high school calculus course that we've set up, they would then just continue seamlessly. So that's a huge, um, I guess, uh, opportunity for students who don't necessarily have the calculus. It also gives students an opportunity who have had calculus and certainly what we saw last semester, as well as what we're in all likelihood gonna see this semester, students will feel that they would like to have a refresher in calculus and they're certainly capable of taking that even if they've taken calculus in their, in their grade 12. Uh, the third and last um, exciting initiative that we're exploring or that we're in the process of actually developing is what we refer to as an alternative pathway. So this is for high achieving students who are not necessarily in grade 12 math courses at all. So provided that a student has uh, 3U functions and does not necessarily have 4U advanced functions or calculus, we are setting up a track where students on an exceptional basis, students who um, show us based on five core competencies, I'll just name them really quickly, leadership, creativity, communication skills, passion and compassion, we will be evaluating those students on those five skills, provided that they have really high marks. So we're looking at an 80%, typically an 80% minimum in English here, uh, along with uh, no no marks less than, um, than, than 77% perhaps. As I said, it's still being developed and it should be rolling out in the next week or two. This presents an opportunity for students to actually 
uh, come in with those core competencies, the guide, I guess the goal here is looking for students who have that creative spark, who are a little bit different, who are not the typical business student who says, I want to be an accountant, I want to be a marketing exec, I want to be a management exec in HR, whatever the case may be. There's that creative spark here that we're looking for, that, that innovation, uh, that something different that says, um, I didn't take math, but I have some pretty good ideas and I want to try this. And I recognize that I need some business skills to actually engage in that space. Uh, whether they want to be the uh, curator of a museum, whether they want to open up an art gallery, whether they want to manage a musical group, whatever it might be, it's those kinds of skills that will still require business acumen, but it's that extra creative spark that we're looking for there. So there will be a process. And as I said, that will be rolling out in the next um, in the next week or two through UAC. Um, and uh, and I guess that brings me to um, to the end of my I, I guess my my brief overview of whom we are and what we do. And obviously, if there are any questions that I could uh, that I can answer at this point, excuse me, that at, at this point, I'm uh, I'm here for you. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you very much, Howard. And uh, if you're joining us late, welcome to the Guidance Forum. And we're just wrapping up with Howard uh, Nemiroff, who is the Associate Dean of Undergraduate Studies in the Sprott School of Business. And uh, we're going to open the floor for anyone uh, who wanted to ask Howard a question about the Sprott School of Business. Feel free to put your question in the chat or raise your hand if you have a quick question. Um, if you're still thinking about that, um, uh, actually, we do see a question in the chat. What's the difference between a commerce degree and an economics degree? Okay, so the um, the economics degree, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk. I'll start with the commerce degree. Let's. So the commerce degree focuses on functional areas of business. So it's specifically targeted to business, whether it be profit or um, or not for profit. That's not the issue. But it's it's how to run a business, working through an understanding of all those functional areas. So we have the accounting area, uh, the finance area, the marketing area, the management area information systems, supply chain, everything that affects a business in terms of the decisions of that business. If you think about the difference between business and economics, what economics does is it looks at the structure of the economy. So how does the economy work? Uh, basically, it's a larger scale business, if you want to think about it that way. Uh, so for students who are interested in understanding how the economy functions in terms of whether um, there's a, a demand supply issue in uh, interest rates, um, whether it be how to cost particular things with regard to marginal marginal costs and marginal benefits and so on and so forth. Uh, from from the perspective of a, of an economy, that would be as it pertains to as it pertains to getting a bachelor's of economics as opposed to a bachelor of commerce, which focuses on the business per se that lives within that economy. Uh, so that I think is the is the main basic difference between the two. Students who are getting mm -hmm. bachelors of commerce are typically hired by industry, whereas students who are getting bachelors of economics are typically hired by government agencies. Wonderful, thank you very much. And uh, we have a follow-up. So to clarify, in some cases it may not be, it may be advantageous for students not to take MCV4U in grade 12 if it lowers their overall average. So that is a strategy. Uh, the risk there is that um, when we're talking about the, the alternative methods in terms of, of entry, the alternative methods being the uh, conditional acceptance without calculus or alternatively, the as what we refer to as the, um, the alternative method for higher achieving students, those students would still have to have significantly higher marks in those other courses. So it is a risk. Um, that um, that if they don't take calculus, they are going to be put into a pool that becomes more competitive and there, there would need to be compelling evidence there. I think uh, Jen Sugar has uh, sort of an addition to that as well. And I, I just wanted to add that even if a student, for example, uh, decided not to take calculus um, because they wanted to be admitted uh, with the additional requirement of just taking our version of the first year calculus in that first semester, just to remember that there is a bit of a, I don't want to say a risk, but there is just something for them to consider because they need to pass that course uh, in that first semester in order for them to maintain their offer and stay in the Sprott School of exactly. Business. 
to remember that they're going to be taking a calculus course, but they'll be taking it here at university. And so they're already adjusting to that first year university year. And so as they're kind of getting used to that, they're also sort of taking that calculus course. And so, you know, you know your students well and you know which ones would be able to handle that. Um, but I don't know that that is, let's say, a strategy like not taking it. I don't know would be a strategy. Um, but maybe if they take it and they're not successful in it, then just to know that they have the safety net of being admitted with the math 0009 uh, course that they can take in first term. So I would never really advise a student, you know what, just skip taking functions because, you know, you might get a low mark. So. And, to, and to quickly add to, to, um, to Jen, the other issue too is that <clears throat> if a student um, uh, well, no, I actually, you know, I, I think you've covered it for the most part. Rather than muddying the waters, let's just move on. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your questions. Um, I don't see any more in the chat or hands up, so I want to thank you, Howard, for joining us. Um, we'll get some contact information so people can forward uh, any questions going forward. Um, thank you so much for being the sponsor for this event. Really appreciate it. Um, for those people that are, are joining us, um, we are uh, just finishing up with the uh, Howard Nemeroff, Associate Dean of Undergraduate Studies in the Sprout School of Business. And just a quick reminder um, that we will be doing this each and every Friday with a new sponsor. Uh, next week, we'll be looking at uh, P the Paul Menton Center with the Faculty of Public Affairs, uh, Financial Aid uh, on the November 6th with the Faculty of Arts, and November 13th, we'll be looking at portfolio programs in architecture, industrial design, in the information technology, and that'll be sponsored by the Faculty of Engineering and Design. And housing and residence life services will be on the 27th. These are select topics that you had mentioned you wanted to hear about. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to, uh, yeah, in the chat, you can see Rhonda put her, her email address there for uh, follow-up questions for Sprott. So moving forward with our agenda, uh, you, once sir. again, welcome. Thank you, Howard, for joining us. Uh, I'm going to pass it over now to Susan Borjo, excuse me, Susan, who is a coordinator of programs in the Enriched uh, Support Program. And it's our pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining us. And you might be muted. Unmuting myself definitely helps. Uh, hi, everyone. Well Good morning. Um, I'm happy to join you this morning. I, I made a few slides just to keep me on track and just to give you kind of broad strokes overview of the of the program itself. And then I'll throw it open to questions, but like feel free to kind of pop them in along the way. So I'm going to share those slides with you. Um, so the program itself was really created as an opportunity for students who have the potential to do well at university, but maybe their grades in that final year of high school don't reflect it, or maybe they're missing a prerequisite subject. Maybe they started in a college stream and they're trying to move into a university stream and they don't have six UNM level courses. So our program is really there for students who need um, an extra opportunity to come to university. It offers first year studies, but in a supported learning environment to try and help them with that transition and to ensure that they get the support that they need to end up qualifying for that degree at the end of their of their studies with us. So they study in ESP for one year, and if they meet the GPA requirement that they need for the program that they're interested in, uh, they are um, off and in, into that program at the end of their ESP year. Uh, we have pathways into programs in arts and social sciences, business, engineering, computer science, science. So uh, students can get to just about any de degree from ESP. We also have a sister program within the center uh, called the Indigenous Enriched Support Program for Indigenous Students. And it has the same sort of structure as ESP, but it has Indigenous specific supports. So a core uh, first year seminar that they take with an Indigenous instructor, um, peer mentors who are former IESP students who work with the new students, um, and, and really connections to the Indigenous community on the campus. What the program looks like sort of as a student comes in and what they register in, uh, this slide kind of gives you an overview of that. So they're taking three first year credits instead of five. So they're in a slightly reduced course load, but in the same number of hours as other students, they're just spending their hours a little bit differently um, in taking these 
workshops that are there to support them in their courses. So they're taking one course that's a core course taught by our faculty and then two others according to what they might be uh, interested in going into. So if people in our science and engineering stream are taking math and chemistry, people in the arts and social sciences, I don't know, they might be taking from a variety of first year courses like law, psychology, sociology, that type of thing. The only difference between them and any other student in the university is that they have this weekly workshop that's built into their schedule. It's organized study time led by an upper year student in that field who's designing activities to get people working together and really learning how to learn. So it's helps helping students with that transition to university level study and helping them get the skills that they need to be able to achieve going forward. Uh, in addition, we have dedicated student advisors and one on one academic coaches who can work with students in one to one meetings. So right now all that's taking place virtually as students are meeting with us uh, online. Um, just like everything in this in this new environment. The application itself consists of more than just looking at their grades because we want to know a bit about the student um, in order to make sure that we're not setting them up to fail. So for our academic or our admissions requirements or sorry for our application, um, we look at a number of things. We look at their grades through all their years of high school. We ask them to provide letters of reference from teachers or a teacher and a guidance counselor. And we ask them to write a personal statement that tells us a little bit about themselves and their circumstances and why they might um, need this program as a, as a sort of pathway to their studies. They apply to us directly as opposed to through the University Application Center, although if they have applied through the University Application Center, that's fine. Um, but they would need to do an additional application to our program and just I know that some students get a little bit nervous about this just so they're aware one application won't affect the other. So if they do have an existing application into the, um, you know, admission through the traditional channels and they also apply to ESP, it's not like if they get into ESP, well, admissions will just say, oh, never mind, they already got into ESP. Um, you know, one application won't affect the other in any kind of negative way. So. Um, the application deadlines, we do admit students in January as well as in the fall. So our winter deadline is coming up. It's November 15th, um, although that'll be extended into December. Uh, our, our deadlines are often extended. As long as space remains in the program, we extend the deadline. And in terms of admissions requirements, I won't read this whole table, but I'll just say that these are on our website. Um, in general, I can say that students do need to be in a position to graduate, obviously, before they can join the program, and they need half of their grade 12 courses to be at the UNM level. Sorry, my slides are getting away from me. Um, so they need to have a, a, at least three out of those six credits in grade 12 to be for U or for M courses. Um, Arts and social sciences, there's no specific mandatory uh, course, um, but the other the other streams do have mandatory courses. Sorry. Um, and uh, th that's listed on our website. And we do have a website that kind of condenses all that key information for you um, for guidance counselors, like how to apply, how to submit a reference, um, what those minimum um, academic requirements are. So I didn't want to take up all of our time um, with me talking. I, I wanted to, to kind of put it open to questions. So that's my presentation. And uh, if anyone does have any questions, I'm happy to speak to that. Thank you very much, Susan. Appreciate that. And um, Susan has been such a um, campus champion for us for so many, so many years. Thank you so much for for being here. Um, we had your we put up your website here in in the chat. Is that Perfect. the best way to find you later um, if people want to ask questions? Yeah, I'm also I'll type my um, email address there as well because um, I'm happy to answer questions um, to my email address. So OK, very good. Um, if you're joining us, um, we're talking about the Enriched Support Program before we bump over and we talk about uh, it, uh, selected mission to uh, missions topics with uh, Jen Sugar. And uh, Susan is available for any questions. If you have any, um, you can unmute and ask them if, uh, or put up your hand would be great so we can track that. Or you can shoot a question into the chat. We're tracking that as well. And um, I know from the Ontario University Guidance Dialogues this week, I want to thank everybody for joining. It was a lot of hours of this kind of thing, and we certainly uh, did use the chat in a in a productive way. So if you want to put something in there, feel free to do so. Okay, and um, 
just going to wait one second. Seeing no questions at this time, Susan has, uh, has uh, put her email address in the chat so you can um, check, check out with her uh, if you have questions going forward. So thank you very much, Susan, once again, for being here. Thanks, everyone. Okay, um, yeah, so as I mentioned at the outset, we went out to you to ask you what are the select topics you'd like for us to uh, to speak to uh, over the for course of the guidance forums, which are running each and every Friday. And just to sort of promo them uh, real quick, going forward, we'll have uh, the Paul Menton Center will be here next Friday at nine with the Faculty of Public Affairs. So be, be, uh, be sure to join us for that. And without further ado, I'll pass it over to Jen Sugar um to speak about select admissions topics uh this week thanks for joining us jen thanks trevor um so what i want to do uh so for those of you i'll just say in advance um for those of you who were here uh last friday and who are tuning in again uh i'll just give you permission if you want to log off the call if you don't want to hear some of the same topics again you're quite welcome to i will not take it personally if you leave the call that's okay um, but if you want to hear some of those topics again or ask any additional questions that have come up over the uh, uh, over the week, uh, then I'm happy to entertain those, no problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through uh, some of the topics that have come up uh, most frequently uh, in regard to us chatting with uh, students and guidance counselors and so on. Um, I'll give a little bit of an update of um, some of the things that we're looking to for this coming uh, this coming cycle and then I'll open it up to questions for anyone who has questions. So the biggest question uh, and the thing that comes up most often uh, right now is uh, is what are we doing in terms of making offers in regard to the new quadmester and octomester system? Um, and so for those of you who have been doing this for a while, you'd know that if students apply uh, basically any time between now and December, um, typically uh, the first round of grades that we would normally get for them would only be grade 11 grades. Um, but this year, because students are doing quadmester and octomester courses, uh, what we know is that when we get the first grade distribution in November, we will have a combination of grade 11 and grade 12 courses because we will have all of the students completed grade 11 courses and their first two completed grade 12 courses. And what that means is that basically throughout the entire cycle, we will be using a combination of grade 12 and grade 11 courses in order to make conditional offers of admission. We're still going to be making rolling offers of admission, and so it is still slated right now that we will um, have grade distributions in November, in February, in April, and in July. And basically what's going to happen is at each point, whenever we get new grades, we will work those grades into the admission average um, and we will look at the grade uh, at the averages that we're using at that moment. And then as soon as the averages match, as soon as the student's average is high enough in the required courses and in their overall average, we'll be able to make them an offer of admission. Um, and so the process actually isn't going to be that different from previous years. The one thing that will be different is in previous years uh, when students have applied by April of second semester, uh, we would have had all grade 12 courses um, for students. And so we would have had their completed first term grade 12 and we would have had midterm grades for all of their second term courses. Because of the way the quadmester and the octomester are working this year, we know that the grades for students who are um, in courses in that last chunk, that those grades um, that those grades will uh, not be available to us until uh, July. And so what that means is that for a lot longer during the cycle, we will be making offers using grade 11 grades. And so basically whenever we're missing certain courses at that grade 12 level, we will go back, we will dip back to the grade 11 um, and grab any courses that we need from grade 11. So um, that's a little bit about just sort of how the how the cycle is going to work. Um, basically, the message that we've been giving to students is that um, is that they should expect that we will be using um, a, basically a combination of grade 11 and grade 12 courses. So that is uh, that gives you a little bit in terms of uh, the timing for offers. I just wanted to also talk a little bit about averages. 
Um, in terms of averages, when uh, students are looking at our view book, and for those of you who have our view book, you can look at um, you can look at our uh, pages 72 through to 74. And if you look at those pages, what you'll be able to see is you'll be able to see the averages that we've put there um, for students to look at as in terms of a minimum cutoff range uh, for each of the programs. And then we've also provided the 2019 incoming class average. And so what that does is it gives students an idea of what is the minimum average they need in order to apply, um, but also what was the average incoming average for students who came in in 2019? Because it gives them an idea of the strength of the program and um, how competitive um, some of these programs can be. And so when we look at that minimum cutoff range, when you see a range in any of our tables, my typical advice to students is that if they see a range, especially now at the beginning of the year, I usually advise them to uh, shoot for the top of the range because then that way that gives them a bit of a buffer um, and it allows them to um, you know, just have a little bit of um, wiggle room as they go through the cycle. So that is um, that's a little bit on averages. The other thing that I wanted to mention about averages is that students should know that we calculate two admission averages for them. We calculate an overall average and we also calculate a prerequisite average. And so again, when they see that cutoff range, they should know that we're applying that to the prerequisite courses that are needed for the program and also the overall average. So it's important that they do well in both the prerequisite courses that are needed for the program and also with their overall average. So that's just something um, for them to take, in, to take into account as well. Um, in terms of things that are uh, happening this cycle, um, you'll notice when we do start making offers that, you know, we're making offers, you know, being hopeful and, and hopeful that uh, things will be able to return to a little bit of normalcy um, next fall. And so we will be making offers of admission with guaranteed residents for students who are interested in guaranteed residents. And so uh, you'll see um, when, when your students talk to you about their offers, they will have all of the traditional um, pieces on uh, pieces of the offer, including the offer of guaranteed residents. Um, and so that's something that um, uh, that they'll be able to look at. Now, whatever happens next cycle, we're, we don't really know, but again, we're quite hopeful. Um, and that sort of speaks to another piece as well, is that we're trying to keep things as consistent as possible for students and for you. Um, and so as a sector, you know, we've met several times about COVID and about different things related to COVID um, and about managing expectations and so on. And one of the things that we're really trying to do is keep the deadlines the same as they have been in previous years. So you'll notice that the deadline for students to apply is still in the middle of January. Uh, the June 1st response date is still there. Many of those traditional dates um, that you would have normally been accustomed to seeing through the OUAC are still there. And, and we're trying as a sector to keep those things consistent on purpose, um, just to try to help people have one less thing to manage in terms of change, because there is already a lot of change out there and a lot of detail has changed. And so we're trying to keep some things consistent as much as we can. Um, in terms of uh, students' questions to us, one of the things that we are hearing from students is, what if things go badly? Uh, what if I don't do well? And I'll be honest, we hear this every year. Um, students always start off the year asking us, what happens if I do badly? What happens if I don't do well? Um, and at this stage, because it's still so early, what we're saying to students is do your best, um, try your best. We know very much that both guidance counselors and teachers um, are there for students to help them manage this new learning environment and to help them deal with uh, the content in this new format and to help them you know, absorb content and be able to get all of the learning outcomes that they need, even though they're working in a new format. And so basically what we're saying to students is take advantage of that, take advantage of the help from guidance counselors, take advantage of help from teachers, do your best, um, 
and uh, and then we'll see where we end up um, in as with any other year. There's no sense in talking about what if I do badly right now, um, you know, because there's just still so much distance between now and the end of the year. And so so that's the message that we're giving to students. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop uh, and I'm going to take questions because I can see there's one in the chat. So I'll start with the one in the chat and then if any other folks have questions, you can either raise your hand or feel free to put your question in the in the chat. Um, so the question in the chat was the viewbook has last year's admissions averages, which are very high. Is that what students will require to get in this year? or is it the cutoff range? Um, so typically it is the cutoff range and that's what the, the top of the cutoff range, like I said, is what I encourage students to shoot for. And if they are shooting for the top of the cutoff range, uh, there should be no issues with them getting into the program at all. Uh, the incoming class average that we've published um, is just an idea of, gives you an idea of the strength of the students um, that are coming in. Uh, that's really, that's really just what it gives you an idea of. But the top of the cutoff range um, is always a really safe place to be for students. And so you can use that as a really good guide. Um, so Trevor, I don't know if you are seeing hands up that I'm not seeing or seeing other questions or anything like that, but um, just wave at me if there's something that I'm missing. <laughs> OK, um, no, thank you very much for the question, Anika. Uh, if anyone else has any questions and they want to pop those in the chat or put your hand up, uh, this is the opportunity to get uh, it answered from the top, the one, the only, Jen Sugar. Um, um, thank you very much for, for joining us again, uh, Jen. And as mentioned, just a promo that we're we're doing this every Friday at nine. So um, I know a lot of people were sad that they didn't get the bacon at the, the guidance breakfast this year. Um, so, you know, make some bacon for yourself next week or, or now. And uh, we will be just to talk about the, the schedule just a little bit while you maybe you're mulling a couple of questions. Um, next Friday, we'll be doing this once again at 9 a.m. with the Paul Menton Center and the Faculty of Public Affairs will be the sponsor. And the week after, we'll be doing uh, financial aid with uh, the sponsor being the Faculty of Arts. And uh, the 13th, I, I think, is going to be fun too because um, with the guests, we've been trying to take topics that you had suggested um, that you get a lot of questions about and sort of toolkit issues. And there's there isn't a, a more relevant topic that way than than portfolio programs and they're they're intricate. And as we get later into the you know when students start applying and um, you know they start thinking about those sort of things that are happening after uh, you know um, in the next semester uh, of university and handing out um, or say handing in the portfolio programs uh, their portfolios. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have you know architecture, uh, industrial design. And uh, we have the information technology and multimedia design. You know, they all have their own sort of, um, you know, uh, intricacies in terms of the portfolios. Um, you know, it can be confusing for the counselors to know what it is exactly for all of ours and then all the other universities. So um, we're going to have the professors who who are involved um, intimately with that that process to come on and talk about, you know, a lot of those sort of things, which I think is going to be sort of invaluable. And um, this has been a really good process because, uh, yeah, we don't get the bacon and we don't get the, that one day event, but we have this great touchstone every Friday to, 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 to circle back on these topics. So it's been really great to see so many people take advantage of it. I wondered honestly this week, because we had, um, there's gonna be a lot of counselors who are extremely, what they call, you know, zoomed out this week, because we did so much with the university guidance dialogue. So it's, it's really nice to see everybody. And then at the end of November, we're going to do um, housing, residence, life services, um, because once again, we're starting to think about, well, I have applied to Carleton and, uh, you know, I'm starting, you know, offers are going to be starting to come out. And, yeah, you know, I'm thinking about the next step, like, we're, 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 you know, how do I get into housing and what are, what are the, you know, how's that uh, my decision going to be impacted uh, by that? So um, one of the questions that came out in the in the university guidance dialogues that I'll just talk about real quick uh, in having an offshoot with with some counselors was the idea that that pins pin numbers are coming out from UAC at all different points. Um, and that was kind of a little bit of a friction point for some of the guidance counselors, knowing that well, my school has as um, is getting pins 
this week, and 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 I heard that some schools are, have already got them for a couple of weeks ago. That's not a process, obviously, that we control. So um, when the Ontario University Application Centre is sending out pins to the schools, um, we don't have any any say in that. I, I do share that you know that feedback with the with the people there, you know, because they're um, psychologically, you know, um, students or counselors feel like, well, they they get a, a jump up on everybody because they got their pins and they were able to apply earlier than other people. And, and I and I get the uh, that it's, you know, they start to feel competitive and maybe if someone else applied first, they're going to get the offer and it's going to be, and there's not going to be any offers left, but that's kind of not the way it works. So um, maybe I can prompt Jen, um, can you speak to that process a little bit? Because we do get some anxiety from counselors and students about, well, uh, they they got theirs in first and they're not going to be more room for me. So what would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, I think you know, and thanks for bringing that up because I know that it's something that, um, that some folks are concerned about. And um, I guess the, the simplest way to put it is there is literally no advantage to getting the application in early. Uh, so regardless of when the student um, gets their pin, whether it's in December or, you know, whether it's now or it, it really doesn't matter, there is no advantage. Um, I think sometimes there's this idea that there's like a, a time that students apply for early acceptance and then everything else is like later acceptance but that's not the case as i talked about earlier we do rolling offers of admission we get distributions of grades every time we get a distribution of grades we compare it to the averages we're using at the moment and as soon as we can make an offer we do um and so there's no shortage of you know it's not like we're going to stop making offers to certain programs by February or something like that. That is just simply not the case. And so what we say to parents and students and everyone who asks is there is no advantage to applying early whenever students get their pin and complete their application. That is completely fine. Um, and so just to simply and categorically say it's all good. And um, the, a lot of times I come to, um, I, well, I used to walk down the hall and I'd say to Jen or, or assistant director, I'd say, I know the answer to this question, but I need you to hear you say it. And and that's one of the things. So I, I, I was wanted to prompt you to just, to, as the voice of uh, the expert in the room on this, to, to just to mention that. So um, yeah, so Paul, th um, Making that point, students are very confused on on that topic. So I'm glad that we were able to circle back on on that feedback that we got from the university guidance dialogues uh, this week. Um, I don't see any other questions, and what I'm going to do is I wanted to um, um, I wanted to promo something else that, that's sort of like right at our doorstep here. We're rolling out a lot of new events uh, this afternoon at uh, four o'clock. We had the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences Spotlight. Um, this is something we'll also do on Fridays every week. Um, and uh, this week we're going to be focusing on what well, it's basically a, a session where we have faculty members interviewing current students in the in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. I think this is going to be a huge week uh, if you can promote it for us because we have um, the cognitive science uh, degree. Mark McLeod's going to join us with a student. I'm excited about that because my daughter is actually in the second year of that program, so I'm interested to see that. And, and then we have um, philosophy. And then we have psychology with Matt Sorley. And the uh, I, I'm excited because if there was one program within the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences that we get to ask the most about over and over and over again is psychology. So you're going to have a ton of students interested in, in these topics. And we'll be doing that today at four in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences spotlights. And tomorrow is huge because we're doing uh, our virtual open house. And um, tomorrow students can, can join us for uh, the business school and uh, the Faculty of Engineering on October 24th. And we're putting uh, the link now in the chat for the virtual open house. So hopefully students can can join us for that. And uh, on November 7th, we're going to do a follow up in another one where we uh, choose the topics of arts, public affairs and uh, the Bachelor of Science. Uh, the science faculty will be on November 7th. So uh, yeah, a couple links there for you to check out to promote to your students. And um, with that, um, uh, any last chance for any questions or hands to go up before we conclude? Okay, so 
Uh, I'll draw the, the session to a close. Thank you to our sponsor, this Broad School of Business, and our guests, the Enriched Support Program, once again for joining us today. And obviously, Jen, thank you so much for dedicating your time every Friday to this. And everyone, have a uh, safe and enjoyable weekend. Thanks again for joining us today.